Antonio Santi Giuseppe Miucci, Italian, and Tnjo Miuti, the 13th of April 1808 to the 18th of October 1889, was an Italian inventor and an associate of Giuseppe Garibaldi, a major political figure in the history of Italy. Miucci is best known for developing the first telephone. Miucci set up a form of voice communication link in his Staten Island, New York, home that connected the second floor bedroom to his laboratory. He submitted a patent caveat for his telephonic device to the U.S. Patent Office in 1871, but there was no mention of electromagnetic transmission of vocal sound in his caveat. In 1876, Alexander Graham Bell was granted a patent for the electromagnetic transmission of vocal sound by undulatory electric current. Despite the long-standing general crediting of Bell with the accomplishment, the Italian government later honored Miucci with the title, Inventor Ufficiale del Telefono, or Official Inventor of the Telephone. The U.S. House of Representatives also honored Miucci in a resolution in 2002 for having had some role in the development of the telephone although the U.S. Senate did not join the resolution and the interpretation of the resolution is disputed. <laughs> Early life Miucci was born at Via dei Seragli 44 in the San Frediano borough of Florence, Grand Duchy of Tuscany now in the Italian Republic, on 13 April 1808, as the first of nine children to Amatis Miucci and Domenica Pepi. Amatis was at times a government clerk and a member of the local police, and Domenica was principally a homemaker. Four of Miucci's siblings did not survive childhood. In November 1821, at the age of 15, he was admitted to Florence Academy of Fine Arts as its youngest student, where he studied chemical and mechanical engineering. He ceased full time studies two years later due to insufficient funds, but continued studying part time after obtaining employment as an assistant gatekeeper and customs official for the Florentine government. Miucci later became employed at the Teatro della Pergola in Florence as a stage technician, assisting Artemio Canovetti. In 1834, Miucci constructed a type of acoustic telephone to communicate between the stage and control room at the Teatro of Pergola. This telephone was constructed on the principles of pipe telephones used on ships and still functions. He married costume designer Esther Mochi, who was employed in the same theater, on 7 August 1834. <laughs> Havana, Cuba In October 1835, Miucci and his wife emigrated to Cuba, then a Spanish province, where Miucci accepted a job at what was then called the Teatro Tacón in Havana at the time, the greatest theater in the Americas. In Havana he constructed a system for water purification and reconstructed the Gran Teatro. In 1848 his contract with the governor expired. Miucci was asked by a friend's doctors to work on Franz Anton Mesmer's therapy system on patients suffering from rheumatism. In 1849, he developed a popular method of using electric shocks to treat illness and subsequently experimentally developed a device through which one could hear inarticulate human voice. He called this device, Telegrafo Parlante, lit. Talking Telegraph. In 1850, the third renewal of Miucci's contract with Don Francisco Marti y Torrens expired, and his friendship with General Giuseppe Garibaldi made him a suspect citizen in Cuba. On the other hand, the fame reached by Samuel F. B. Morse in the United States encouraged Miucci to make his living through inventions. Move to Staten Island, New York 
On 13 April 1850, Miucci and his wife emigrated to the United States, taking with them approximately 26,000 pesos fuertes in savings approximately $500,000 in 2010 dollars, and settled in the Clifton area of Staten Island, New York. The Miucci's would live there for the remainder of their lives. On Staten Island he helped several countrymen committed to the Italian unification movement and who had escaped political persecution. Miucci invested the substantial capital he had earned in Cuba in a tallow candle factory the first of this kind in America employing several Italian exiles. For two years Miucci hosted friends at his cottage, including General Giuseppe Garibaldi, and Colonel Paolo Bovi Campeggi, who arrived in New York two months after Miucci. They worked in Miucci's factory. In 1854, Miucci's wife Esther became an invalid due to rheumatoid arthritis. Miucci continued his experiments. Topic: Electromagnetic telephone. Miucci studied the principles of electromagnetic voice transmission for many years and was able to realize his dream of transmitting his voice through wires in 1856. He installed a telephone-like device within his house in order to communicate with his wife who was ill at the time. Some of Miucci's notes written in 1857 describe the basic principle of electromagnetic voice transmission or in other words, the telephone consist in un diaphragma vibrant e in un magnet elettrizzato da un filo a spiral che lo avolge vibrando, il diaphragma altera la corrente del magnet. Queste alterazioni di correnti, trasmesse all'altro capo del filo, imprimono analog vibrazioni al diaframma ricevente e riproducono la parola. Translated It consists of a vibrating diaphragm and an electrified magnet with a spiral wire that wraps around it. The vibrating diaphragm alters the current of the magnet. These alterations of current, transmitted to the other end of the wire, create analogous vibrations of the receiving diaphragm and reproduce the word. Miucci devised an electromagnetic telephone as a way of connecting his second-floor bedroom to his basement laboratory, and thus being able to communicate with his wife. Between 1856 and 1870, Miucci developed more than 30 different kinds of telephones on the basis of this prototype. Around 1858, painter Nestor Karate sketched Miucci's ideas. This drawing was used as the image on a stamp produced in 2003 by the Italian Postal and Telegraph Society. Miucci intended to develop his prototype but did not have the financial means to keep his company afloat in order to finance his invention. His candle factory went bankrupt and Miucci was forced to unsuccessfully seek funds from rich Italian families. In 1860, he asked his friend Enrico Bandolari to look for Italian capitalists willing to finance his project. However, military expeditions led by Garibaldi in Italy had made the political situation in that country too unstable for anybody to invest. Miucci then published his invention in the New York Italian language newspaper Leco d'Italia, although no copy of such reports have ever been located dating back to searches prior to his court case in the 1880s. <laughs> Telegraph Bankruptcy At the same time, Miucci was led to poverty by some fraudulent debtors. On 13 November 1861 his cottage was auctioned. The purchaser allowed the Miucci's to live in the cottage without paying rent, but Miucci's private finances dwindled and he soon had to live on public funds and by depending on his friends. 
As mentioned in William J. Wallace's ruling, during the years 1859, 1860, and 1861, Miucci was in close business and social relations with William E. Ryder, who was interested in his inventions, paid the expenses of his experiments, and invested money in Miucci's inventions. Their close working friendship continued until 1867. In August 1870, Miucci reportedly was able to capture a transmission of articulated human voice at the distance of a mile by using a copper plate as a conductor, insulated by cotton. He called this device the teletrofono. While he was recovering from injuries that befell him in a boiler explosion aboard a Staten Island ferry, the Westfield, Miucci's financial and health state was so bad that his wife sold his drawings and devices to a second-hand dealer to raise money. <laughs> <laughs> Patent caveat On 12 December 1871 Miucci set up an agreement with Angelo Zilio Grandi Secretary of the Italian Consulate in New York, Angelo Antonio Tremachin entrepreneur, Sereno G.P. Bregulia Tremachin businessman, in order to constitute the Teletrofono Company. The constitution was notarized by Angelo Bertolino, a notary public of New York. Although their society funded him with $20, only $15 was needed to file for a full patent application. The caveat his lawyer submitted to the U.S. Patent Office on 28 December 1871 was numbered 3335 and titled, Sound Telegraph. The following is the text of Miucci's caveat, omitting legal details of the petition, oath, and jurat. Topic. Analysis of Miucci's caveat Miucci repeatedly focused on insulating the electrical conductor and even insulating the people communicating, but does not explain why this would be desirable. The mouthpiece is like a speaking trumpet, so that the sound concentrated upon the wire is communicated to the other person, but he does not say that the sound is converted to variable electrical conduction in the wire. Another instrument is also applied to the ears, but he does not say that variable electrical conduction in the wire is to be converted to sound. In the third claim, he claims, a sound conductor which is also an electrical conductor, as a means of communication by sound which is consistent with acoustic sound vibrations in the wire that somehow get transmitted better if electrical conductors such as a wire or metallic tube are used. Miucci emphasizes that the conductors for mouth and ears must be metallic, but does not explain why this would be desirable. He mentions communication with the ground but does not suggest that a ground return must complete a circuit if only the wire singular not plural is used between the sender's mouthpiece and the receiver's earpiece with one or the other person being electrically insulated from the ground by means of glass insulators consists in isolating two persons by placing them upon glass insulators, employing glass, for example, at the foot of the chair or bench on which each sits, and putting them in communication by means of a telegraph wire. Robert V. Bruce, a biographer of Bell, asserted that Miucci's caveat could never have become a patent because it never described an electric telephone. Topic. Conflicting opinions of Miucci biographers 
According to Robert V. Bruce, Miucci's own testimony as presented by Schiavo would demonstrate that the Italian inventor did not understand the basic principles of the electric telephone, either before Bell patented it, or for several years after Bell patented it. Other researchers have pointed to inconsistencies and inaccuracies in Bruce's account of the invention of the telephone, firstly, with the name used by Miucci to describe his invention. Bruce referred to Miucci's device as a «telephone», not as the «teletrofono». Bruce's reporting of Miucci's purported relationship with Dr. Seth R. Beckwith has been deemed inaccurate. Miucci and his legal representative had cautioned Beckwith against misusing Miucci's name for financial gain. Vis a vis the company Beckwith founded in New Jersey, not only did Beckwith's Globe Telephone Co. base its claims against the Bell Telephone Company on Miucci's caveat, but the claims were also supported by approximately 30 affidavits. Davids, which stated that Miucci had repeatedly built and used different types of electric telephones several years before Bell did. English historian William Aitken does not share Robert V. Bruce's viewpoint. Bruce had indirectly referred to Miucci as the silliest and weakest impostor. While Aitken went so far as to define Miucci as the first creator of an electrical telephone, other recognition of Miucci's work in the past came from the International Telecommunication Union, positing that Miucci's work was one of the four precursors to Bell's telephone, as well as from the Smithsonian Institution, which listed Miucci as one of the eight most important inventors of the telephone in a 1976 exhibit. Miucci and his business partners hired an attorney, J. D. Stetson, who filed a caveat on behalf of Miucci with the patent office. They had wanted to prepare a patent application, but the partners did not provide the $250 fee, so all that was prepared was a caveat, since the fee for that was only $20. However, the caveat did not contain a clear description of how the asserted invention would actually function. Miucci advocates claim the attorney erased margin notes Miucci had added to the document. Topic: <inaudible> Teletrofono Company. In 1872, Miucci and his friend Angelo Bertolino went to Edward B. Grant, vice president of American District Telegraph Co. of New York, not Western Union as sometimes stated, to ask for help. Miucci asked him for permission to test his apparatus on the company's telegraph lines. He gave Grant a description of his prototype and a copy of his caveat. After waiting two years, Miucci went to Grant and asked for his documents back, but Grant allegedly told him they had been lost. Around 1873, a man named Bill Carroll from Boston, who had news about Miucci's invention, asked him to construct a telephone for divers. This device should allow divers to communicate with people on the surface. In Miucci's drawing, this device is essentially an electromagnetic telephone encapsulated to be waterproof. On the 28th of December 1874, Miucci's Teletrofono patent caveat expired. Critics dispute the claim that Miucci could not afford to file for a patent or renew his caveat, as he filed for and was granted full patents in 1872, 1873, 1875, and 1876, at the cost of $35 each, as well as one additional $10 patent caveat, all totaling $150, for inventions unrelated to the telephone. After Bell secured his patents in 18 1976 and subsequent years, the Bell Telephone Company filed suit in court against the Globe Telephone Company amongst many others for patent infringement. Purportedly too poor to hire a legal team, Miucci was represented only by lawyer Joe Melly, an orphan whom Miucci treated as his own son. While American Bell Telephone Company v. Globe Telephone Company, Antonio Miucci, et al., was still proceeding. Bell also became involved with the U.S. government v. 
American Bell Telephone Company, instigated by the Pan Electric Telephone Company, which had secretly given the U.S. Attorney General 10% of its shares, employed him as a director, and then asked him to void Bell's patent. Had he succeeded in overturning Bell's patent, the U.S. Attorney General stood to become exceedingly rich by reason of his shares. Topic trial the Havana experiments were briefly mentioned in a letter by Miucci, published by Il Commercio di Genova of 1 December 1865 and by Laco d'Italia of 21 October 1865 both existing today, an important pieces of evidence brought up in the trial was Miucci's memorandum book, which contained Miucci's noted drawings and records between 1862 and 1882. In the trial, Antonio Miucci was accused of having produced records after Bell's invention and back-dated them. As proof, the prosecutor brought forward the fact that the Ryder and Clark Company was founded only in 1863. At trial, Miucci said William E. Ryder himself, one of the owners, had given him a copy of the memorandum book in 1862. However, Miucci was not believed. On the 13th of January 1887, the United States government moved to annul the patent issued to Bell on the grounds of fraud and misrepresentation. After a series of decisions and reversals, the Bell Company won a decision in the Supreme Court, though a couple of the original claims from the lower court cases were left undecided. By the time that the trial wound its way through nine years of legal battles, the U.S. prosecuting attorney had died and the two Bell patents number 174465 dated 7 March 1876 and number 186787 dated 30 January 1877 were no longer in effect, although the presiding judges agreed to continue the proceedings due to the case's importance as a precedent. With a change in administration and charges of conflict of interest on both sides arising from the original trial, the U.S. Attorney General dropped the lawsuit on 30 November 1897 leaving several issues undecided on the merits. During a deposition filed for the 1887 trial, Miucci claimed to have created the first working model of a telephone in Italy in 1834. In 1886, in the first of three cases in which he was involved, Miucci took the stand as a witness in the hopes of establishing his invention's priority. Miucci's evidence in this case was disputed due to lack of material evidence of his inventions as his working models were reportedly lost at the laboratory of American District Telegraph ADT of New York. ADT did not merge with Western Union to become its subsidiary until 1901. Miucci's patent caveat had described a lover's telegraph, which transmitted sound vibrations mechanically across a taut wire, a conclusion that was also noted in various reviews. The court further held that the caveat of Miucci did not describe any elements of an electric speaking telephone, and the court held that Miucci's device consisted of a mechanical telephone consisting of a mouthpiece and an earpiece connected by a wire, and that beyond this the invention of Miucci was only imagination. Miucci's work, like many other inventors of the period, was based on earlier acoustic principles and despite evidence of earlier experiments, the final case involving Miucci was eventually dropped upon his death. Death. Astaire Miucci became increasingly frail and was invalided for approximately five years before dying in 1884. Miucci became ill in March 1889, and died on 18 October 1889 in Clifton, Staten Island, New York City. <laughs> Invention of the telephone 
There has been much dispute over who deserves recognition as the first inventor of the telephone, although Bell was credited with being the first to transmit articulate speech by undulatory currents of electricity. The Federazione Italiana di Elettrotecnica has devoted a museum to Miucci making a chronology of his inventing the telephone and tracing the history of the two trials opposing Miucci and Bell. They support the claim that Antonio Miucci was the real inventor of the telephone. However, some scholars outside Italy do not recognize the claims that Miucci's device had any bearing on the development of the telephone. Tomas Farley also writes that, "...nearly every scholar agrees that Bell and Watson were the first to transmit intelligible speech by electrical means." Others transmitted a sound or a click or a buzz but our boys Bell and Watson were the first to transmit speech one could understand." In 1834 Miucci constructed a kind of acoustic telephone as a way to communicate between the stage and control room at the theater Teatro della Pergola in Florence. This telephone was constructed on the model of pipe telephones on ships and is still functional. In 1848, Miucci developed a popular method of using electric shocks to treat rheumatism. He used to give his patients two conductors linked to 60 Bunsen batteries and ending with a cork. He also kept two conductors linked to the same Bunsen batteries. He used to sit in his laboratory, while the Bunsen batteries were placed in a second room and his patients in a third room. In 1849 while providing a treatment to a patient with a 114 volts electrical discharge, in his laboratory Miucci is claimed to have heard his patients scream through the piece of copper wire that was between them, from the conductors he was keeping near his ear. His intuition was that the tongue of copper wire vibrated just like a leave of an electroscope, which meant there was an electrostatic effect. To continue the experiment without hurting his patient, Miucci covered the copper wire with a piece of paper. Through this device he claimed to hear an unarticulated human voice. He called this device, Telegrafo Parlante, lit. Talking Telegraph. On the basis of this prototype, some claim Miucci worked on more than 30 kinds of telephones. In the beginning, he was inspired by the telegraph. Different from other pioneers of the telephone, such as Charles Borsell, Philip Rees, Innocenzo Manzetti, and others, he did not think about transmitting voice by using the principle of the telegraph key in scientific jargon, the make and break method. Instead, he looked for a continuous solution, meaning one that didn't interrupt the electric flux. In 1856, Miucci reportedly constructed the first electromagnetic telephone, made of an electromagnet with a nucleus in the shape of a horseshoe bat, a diaphragm of animal skin, stiffened with potassium dichromate and a metal disc stuck in the middle. The instrument was housed in a cylindrical carton box. He purportedly constructed it to connect his second-floor bedroom to his basement laboratory, and thus communicate with his invalid wife. Miucci separated the two directions of transmission to eliminate the so-called local effect, using what we would call today a four-wire circuit. He constructed a simple calling system with a telegraphic manipulator that short-circuited the instrument of the calling person to make a succession of impulses clicks that were louder than normal conversation. Aware that his device required a bigger band than a telegraph, he found some means to avoid the so-called skin effect. Through superficial treatment of the conductor or by acting on the material copper instead of iron, in 1864, Miucci claimed to have made what he felt was his best device, using an iron diaphragm with optimized thickness and tightly clamped along its rim. The instrument was housed in a shaving soap box, whose cover clamped the diaphragm. In August 1870, Miucci reportedly obtained transmission of articulate human voice at a mile distance by using as a conductor a copper wire insulated by cotton. 
he called his device, Teletrofono. Drawings and notes by Antonio Miucci with a claimed date of 27 September 1870 show that Miucci understood inductive loading on long-distance telephone lines 30 years before any other scientists. The question of whether Bell was the true inventor of the telephone is perhaps the single most litigated fact in U.S. history, and the Bell patents were defended in some 600 cases. Miucci was a defendant in American Bell Telephone Co., v. Globe Telephone Co., and others, the court's findings, reported in 31 Fed. Rep. 729, n. Herbert in his History of the Telephone said, To bait the Bell Company became almost a national sport. Any sort of claimant, with any sort of wild tale of prior invention, could find a speculator to support him. On they came, a motley array, some in rags, some on nags, and some in velvet gowns. One of them claimed to have done wonders with an iron hoop and a file in 1867, a second had a marvelous table with glass legs, a third swore that he had made a telephone in 1860, but did not know what it was until he saw Bell's patent, and a fourth told a vivid story of having heard a bullfrog croak via a telegraph wire which was strung into a certain cellar in receipt in 1851. Judge Wallace's ruling was bitterly regarded by historian Giovanni Schiavo as a miscarriage of justice. <laughs> 2002 U.S. Congressional Resolution In 2002, on the initiative of U.S. Representative Vito Fasella RNY, in cooperation with an Italian-American deputation, the U.S. House of Representatives passed United States HREs, 269 on Antonio Miucci stating, "...that the life and achievements of Antonio Miucci should be recognized, and his work in the invention of the telephone should be acknowledged." According to the preamble, if Miucci had been able to pay the $10 fee to maintain the caveat after 1874, no patent could have been issued to Bell. The resolution's sponsor described it as, a message that rings loud and clear recognizing the true inventor of the telephone, Antonio Miucci. In 2002, some news articles reported that, the resolution said his teletrofono, demonstrated in New York in 1860, made him the inventor of the telephone in the place of Bell, who took out a patent 16 years later. A similar resolution was introduced to the U.S. Senate but no vote was held on the resolution. Despite the House of Representatives' resolution, its interpretation as supporting Miucci's claim as the inventor of the telephone remains disputed. The House of Commons of Canada responded ten days later by unanimously passing a parliamentary motion stating that Alexander Graham Bell was the inventor of the telephone. Others believe House Resolution 260. Redressed a historic injustice, and the Italian newspaper La Repubblica hailed the vote to recognize Miucci as a belated comeuppance for Bell. <laughs> Garibaldi Miucci Museum The Order of the Sons of Italy in America maintains a Garibaldi Miucci Museum on Staten Island. The museum is located in a house that was built in 1840, purchased by Miucci in 1850, and rented to Giuseppe Garibaldi from 1850 to 1854. Exhibits include Miucci's models and drawing and pictures relating to his life. Topic Other inventions This list is also taken from Basilio Catania's historical reconstruction 1825 chemical compound to be used as an improved propellant in fireworks 1834 in the Florence's Teatro della Pergola, he sets up a pipe telephone to communicate from the stage to the maneuver trellis work, at about 18 meters height. 1840 improved filters and chemical processing of waters supplying the city of Havana, Cuba. 
1844 First Electroplating Factory of the Americas, set up in Havana, Cuba. Previously, objects to be electroplated were sent to Paris. 1846 Improved apparatus for electrotherapy, featuring a pulsed current breaker with rotating cross. 1847 Restructuring of the Tacon Theater in Havana, following a hurricane. Miucci conceived a new structure of the roof and ventilation system, to avoid the roof to be taken off in like situations. 1848 Astronomical observations by means of a marine telescope worth $280. 1849 Chemical process for the preservation of corpses, to cope with the high demand for bodies of immigrants to be sent to Europe, avoiding decomposition during the many weeks' navigation. 1849 First invention of electrical transmission of speech. 1850-1 First Stearic Candle Factory of the Americas, set up in Clifton, N.Y., 1855 Realization of Celestas, with crystal bars instead of steel, and pianos one is on display at the Garibaldi Miucci Museum, in Rosebank, N.Y., 1856 First Lager Beer Factory of Staten Island, the Clifton Brewery, in Clifton, N.Y., 1858 to 60 of paraffin candles. U.S. Patent No. 22739 on a candle mold for the same and U.S. Patent No. 30180 on a rotating blade device for finishing the same. 1860 First paraffin candle factory in the world, the New York Paraffin Candle Co., set up in Clifton, N.Y., early in 1860, then moved to Stapleton, N.Y. It produced over 1,000 candles per day. 1860 Experiments on the use of dry batteries in electrical traction and other industrial applications. 1860 Process to turn red corals into a pink color more valued, as requested by Enrico Bendelari, a merchant of New York. 1862 U.S. Patent No. 36192 on a kerosene lamp that generates a very bright flame, without smoke, therefore not needing a glass tube, thanks to electricity developed by two thin platinum plates embracing the flame. 1862-63 process for treating and bleaching oil or kerosene to obtain sicative oils for paint U.S. Patents No. 36419 and No. 38714 Antonio Miucci Patent Oil was sold by Ryder and Clark Co., 51 Broad Street, New York, and exported to Europe. See expert comment. 1864 Invention of new, more destructive ammunition for guns and cannons, proposed to the U.S. Army and to General Giuseppe Garibaldi. 1864-65 Processes to obtain paper pulp from wood or other vegetable substances U.S. Patents No. 44735, No. 47068 and No. 53165. Associated Press was interested in producing paper with this process, which was also the first to introduce the recovery of the leaching liquor. See expert comment. 1865 Process for making wicks out of vegetable fiber, U.S. Patent No. 46607, 1867 A paper factory, the Perth Amboy Fiber Co., was set up, in Perth Amboy, N.J. The paper pulp was obtained from either marsh grass or wood. It was the first to recycle waste paper. See expert comment. 1871 U.S. Patent No. 122478 Effervescent drinks, fruit vitamin rich drinks that Miucci found useful during his recovery from the wounds and burns caused by the explosion of the Westfield Ferry. See expert comment. 1871 filed a patent caveat, not a patent, for a telephone device in December with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office USPTO. 1873 U.S. Patent No. 142071 Sauce for Food. Quote, 
According to Roberto Merloni, general manager of the Italian Star Company, this patent anticipates modern food technologies. See expert comment. 1873 Conception of a screw steamer suitable for navigation in canals. 1874 Process for refining crude oil, caveat. 1875 Filter for tea or coffee, much similar to that used in present day coffee machines. 1875 Household utensil, description not available. Combining usefulness to cheapness, that will find a ready sale. 1875 U.S. Patent No. 168273. Lactometer for chemically detecting adulterations of milk. It anticipates by 15 years the well-known Babcock test. See expert comment. 1875 Upon request by Giuseppe Tagliabue, a physical instruments maker of Brooklyn, NY, Miucci devises and manufactures several aneroid barometers of various shapes. 1875 Miucci decided not to renew his telephone caveat, thus enabling Bell to get a patent. 1876 U.S. Patent No. 183062, Hygrometer, which was a marked improvement over the popular hair hygrometer of the time. He set up a small factory in Staten Island for fabrication of the same. See expert comment. 1878 Method for preventing noise on elevated railways, a problem much felt at the time in New York 1878 Process for fabricating ornamental paraffin candles for Christmas trees. 1880 U.S. Patent Application. Wire for electrical purposes. 1881 Process for making postage and revenue stamps. 1883 U.S. Patent No. 279492, plastic paste, as hard and tenacious to be suitable for billiard balls. Topic: <laughs> Patents. U.S. Patent images in TIFF format. U.S. Patent 22739-1859 Candle Mold U.S. Patent 30180-1860 Candle Mold U.S. Patent 36192-1862 Lamp Burner U.S. Patent 36419-1862 Improvement in Treating Kerosene U.S. Patent 38714-1863 Improvement in preparing hydrocarbon liquid U.S. Patent 44735-1864 Improved process for removing mineral, gummy, and resinous substances from vegetables U.S. Patent 46607-1865 Improved method of making wicks U.S. Patent 47068-1865 Improved process for removing mineral, gummy, and resinous substances from vegetables. U.S. Patent 53165-1866 Improved process for making paper pulp from wood. U.S. Patent 122478-1872 Improved method of manufacturing effervescent drinks from fruits U.S. Patent 142071-1873 Improvement in sauces for food U.S. Patent 168273-1875 Method of testing milk U.S. Patent 183062-1876 Hygrometer U.S. Patent 279492-1883 Plastic paste for billiard balls and vases See also